Hello. So in uh, the previous video I did a couple of days ago, uh, we actually looked at calculating inverse functions. We looked at how we could calculate an inverse function and when an inverse function exists. So remember, inverse functions, uh, they exist if and only if the original function f is a one-to-one -one injective function. So we looked at that before. So in this video, we're going to look at the domain and the range of inverse functions. So we've got a, list, uh, a, a little motivating example here. So let f of x be equal to x squared, where x is bigger than zero. So again, in the question, they tell us the domain here. So we know that that's our domain. So, and I've drawn a little sketch of the graph here as well. So the x squared graph for a positive uh, set of x values. So we want to calculate the inverse function. So this is what we did in that previous video. So the key thing is you want to let y be equal to x squared. And then you can do a, tra uh, a change of coordinates because remember inverse functions are just basically where you flip the x-axis with the y-axis. You just want to do a change of your coordinates. And if you do that, you get x equals y squared. You can then square root both sides. And if we do that, we get y equals the square root of x. And it's going to be the positive square root of x because um, we, don't, we don't want it to be the negative square root of x in this case because we'll see that if we reflect this graph this y equals f of x graph in the line y equals x. So remember, that's what you have to do to get an inverse function. You reflect it in the line y equals x. Um, you would get this kind of um, this shape here when you reflect it. So we want our y coordinates to be positive because obviously the, these the coordinates on the blue curve are obviously positive y coordinates. So that would be our inverse function. So our inverse function would be f inverse of x is equal to the positive square root of x. That would be our inverse function in this case. Now, let's think about the domain and range of this inverse function then. So now we know the domain of this y equals f of x uh, red line. We know that that is uh, x greater than zero because we were told that in the question. And we see that by the graph, the range is f of x bigger than zero. So I mean, the, the x squared graph, uh, sorry, the x squared graph goes up to infinity. So therefore, the range of the graph, we can see up here, the range of y values is ranging from zero all the way up to infinity. So we know that. But how about the domain and range of this inverse blue function here? Well, the domain, well, it looks like to me the domain is going from zero up to infinity. I mean, this is just going to carry on forever and forever, this, uh, this blue line here. So it looks to me like the domain is um, x bigger than zero. OK, and it looks like to me the range of this function. So it's going from zero and this is going up and up and up and up. Uh, so it looks like, again, the range is gonna be f of x, sorry, f inverse of x is greater than zero. So because we reflected the x and the y coordinates around, um, I mean, this is probably not a very good example actually, but what's actually happened is that your range of your initial function is actually the same as your domain of your inverse function because your range of your original one was your your, your range of y values, so basically the height of your uh, your red graph. But your domain of your blue graph is basically the width of your blue graph, and we flip the graph over so that so that when we flip the coordinates over, we flip the axes over the the y and the x coordinates over. Um, the height of this red graph will now be the width of this blue graph. And the width of this red graph will actually now be the width of this blue graph. Sorry, the height of this blue graph. The width of the red graph will be the height of the green, uh, the blue graph. So what we can see when after this change of coordinates is that the range of f will be the same as the domain of f inverse. And actually, the domain of f is the same as the domain of f. Uh, sorry, the range of f inverse. Um, again, this is not a very good example because actually the domains and ranges are the same. But we can see uh, we will see this in, in another example in a minute. Um, so the facts about inverse functions you need to know that is uh, is the following. So if f has a domain where x is in a certain set of numbers, we'll just call that a, and a range where f of x is in a certain set of numbers, we'll call that b, then f inverse has a domain exactly the same as the range has a domain x in the set b. So whatever the, the, the range is of f, the inverse will have a domain of that same set as well. And the range of the inverse function will be the same as the domain of the original function. So the set of f inverse values will be the same set as the set of the domain of the f value. So I've just kind of written the rule down here that you need to know. So the domain of the function is equal to the range of its inverse. And the range of its inverse function is the same as the domain of the original function. And of course, this is for a one-to-one -one f. So if f is not one-to-one, -one, 
um, then obviously f doesn't have an inverse in the first place. Uh, so f must be a one-to-one -one function. Um, but yeah, in, in such case, the domain of f is the range of f inverse, and the range of f inverse is the um, it's the domain of, sorry, I've actually not write, wrote this correctly, so I should really say this instead. I should say that the domain of, um, I should say the, uh, let me write this again. This is not written correctly because I've written the same rule out twice, basically. What I should have written here is that the range of F is the same as the domain of F inverse. So that's the rule that I really should have written out there. So domain of F is the same as range of inverse. Uh, the range of F is the same as the domain of the inverse. Okay, so that's the key thing that you have to learn really from this. Okay, so let's uh, look at an example. So let's say you've got F of X equals sine X with a domain X between minus pi over two and pi over two. So remember, if you've not seen radians yet, uh, pi is equal to, pi radians is equal to 180 degrees. And so therefore, this is actually 90 degrees here. And this is actually minus 90 degrees here, if you want to convert to, degree, uh, to degrees. But normally, we, we will use radians in A-level maths, as we'll see soon. So what is the domain and range for the inverse function? So just a little note here, actually. The inverse function of sine is called sine minus 1. You would have seen that in GCSE when you do sine inverse on your calculator to get your angles. Uh, it, when you do Socrates questions or when you do the sine rule questions that you've seen, um, the inverse of sine is called f, uh, so, sorry, sine minus one. But normally it's probably better to call it arc sine. So um, instead of writing sine inverse, we, we normally call, uh, yeah, we normally call it arc sine. And arc sine is basically the inverse function of sine um, when sine has this domain here specifically, actually. So that's called the arc sine function. Um, so the, the, the inverse of this specific function with this specific domain um, is actually called the arc sine function. If you had different domains, um, it's still the sine inverse function, but it won't necessarily, it, it's not called the arc sine function. The arc sine function is only true for this, this domain here. Um, but you can just think about arc sine. It is the inverse of sine, basically. That's that's how you can think about it. But we'll come on to this in future videos as well, because um, it's one of the topics we are going to look at in more detail. Um, okay, so the domain of the arc sine function is equal to the range of the sine function. So that's what we were saying back here. The domain of your function is the same as the range of your inverse function. Um, and also the other rule down here, the domain of your inverse function is the same as the range of your initial function. So the domain of this inverse, remember, this is our inverse function here, uh, this arc sine function or sine minus one, however you prefer to think about it. This is the same as the range of our initial function. So let's look at our initial function on a sketch of a graph. So the sine graph between minus 90 degrees and 90 degrees does something like this. And it has a height of one up there and a minimum value of minus one down there. So what is the range of this F function then? So the range, so range of F, we can see that by looking at the height of the graph, the range of F of X is, uh, so it's F of X values between minus one and one, because obviously it's going from minus one up to one. So that's our range of F. So how about our domain of arc sine? Well, our domain is going to be the same set. So the domain of the inverse function, so domain of f inverse, so that's going to be the set of x values between minus 1 and 1. So instead of, obviously, because we're dealing with a domain, we're talking about the inputs, the x values, which are your inputs. So the domain of f inverse is going to be minus 1 to 1. So the same as this set there, but just with an x instead. Okay, so that's our... Uh, domain. Now, how about the range of arc sine? So remember, our arc sine is our f inverse, and our f here is our sine. So remember, the range of arc sine, the range of an inverse function, is the same as its domain is uh, as the domain of the initial function. So we know that the um, range of the arc sine function is going to be the same as this domain here because we've specified the domain. So the range of the arc sine function is going to be the same set. So minus pi over two up to pi over two, uh, but instead of an X, because X again is our inputs, uh, we're talking about a range, a range is to do with our outputs. So we're gonna have F inverse in here. So the range of the inverse function goes between minus pi over two and pi over two. And that's how the arc sine graph works. So this is our range for arc sine. Now, if we think about this on a graph to see why this works. So this is our sine graph uh, between minus 90 degrees here, 
uh, pi minus pi over two radians, or pi over two radians up here. Sorry, with pi over two radians up here. Again, ninety degrees going from one to minus one. So arc sine is going to be the reflection in the line y equals x. So the reflection uh, in this line here. So let me try and be a bit neater. Uh, reflection in that line there. That's going to be our uh, y equals x line. So our arc sine inverse function is going to be the reflection of this. So something like, uh, I mean, this isn't a very good sketch, but something, something roughly like that. I mean, really, it should really the gradients there should be really be the same but i mean just just ignore that for now it should be something like this essentially and what's happening is that um so your domain as we can see um from back here the domain was minus one up to one so the domain of our x values goes from minus one to one for this arc sine graph uh but the uh range as we can see over here the range of the inverse sine graph the arc sine graph um, is between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. So this coordinate down here, this uh, y value is going to be minus pi over 2. And this value up here, this uh, positive y value, this uh, maximum y value is going to be pi over 2. So we can see that on the graph. So yeah, so this red graph is y equals arc sine. So the inverse uh, sine function and the black graph is our y equals sine function in our specified domain. Um, so that's just a summary of how we can find inverse functions uh, sorry how, how we can find domains and ranges of, of inverse functions given the uh the domain and range of the initial function uh given in the question that we get um so yeah that's just a summary of that for today